But the confession of the one who is wicked, I am so, is not followed by a reciprocal similar confession. This was not what the judging consciousness meant, quite the contrary. It repels this community of nature, and it is the hard heart that is for itself and which rejects any continuity with the other. As a result, the situation is reversed. The one who made the confession sees himself repulsed and sees the other to be in the wrong when he refuses to let his own inner being come forth into the outer existence of speech when the other contrasts the beauty of his own soul with the penitent's wickedness yet confronts the confession of the penitent with his own stiff-necked, unrepentant character, mutely keeping to himself and refusing to throw himself away for someone else. There is here expressed in its extreme form the rebellion of the spirit that is certain of itself, for it beholds itself as this simple self-knowledge in someone else, and too in such a way that even the outer shape of this other is not, as in the case of a material wealth, something without substantial being, is not a thing. On the contrary, what is held opposed to this other is thought, simply knowledge itself, this absolutely fluid continuity of pure knowing, which refuses to put itself into communication with the other, which in its confession had ipso facto renounced its separate being for self and thereby superseded its particularity. And in doing so, posited itself in continuity with the other as a universal. The other, however, re retains within itself and for itself its uncommunicative being for self, and it retains in face of the individual who did confess just the same uncommunicative being for self, although the latter has already thrown this away. It thereby reveals itself as a consciousness which is forsaken by and which itself denies spirit, for it does not know that spirit, in the absolute certainty of itself, is Lord and master over every deed and actuality and can cast them off and make them as if they had never happened. At the same time, it does not recognize the contradiction it falls into in not letting the rejection, which has taken place in words, be validated as a genuine rejection while in itself it has the certainty of its spirit, not in an actual deed, but in its inner being and finds the outer existence of this inner being in the utterance of its judgment. It is thus its own self which hinders that other's return from the deed into the spiritual existence of speech and into the identity of spirit, and by this hardness of heart produces the disparity which still exists. Paragraph 667 is just as rich and, and deep in many ways as the preceding paragraph 666, in which this moment and movement of confession took place, which was supposed to be reciprocated. And we might have actually seen the two different consciousnesses representing, we could call them different gestalten, different shapes of consciousness brought together. And instead, what we see as we're approaching the end of not just this particular section of spirit, but the entire spirit section, we see a refusal, a rejection, indeed a rebellion against spirit by a certain misunderstanding. I was going to say a certain understanding, but really a certain misunderstanding of what spirit is on the part of the judging consciousness. We, you know, if we wanted to be a little facetious here, we might not just call it the judging consciousness. In English, we might also call it the judgy consciousness. People are often quite worried, this is a bit of an aside, in, in ethics classes or intro to philosophy classes about being, you know, what they view as being judgmental and they don't want to engage in moral judgment because they're, be, they're afraid of being, I won't say the word judged here because then it gets a little bit convoluted, being ascribed the status of being judgmental or judgy. And one of the things that's very liberating in ethics classes is I tell my students, hey, I actually want you to be judgy. I want you to be judgmental. I want you to make judgments. You just have to have good bases 
for doing so. And you have to be willing to have your own judgments called into question, not to just throw them out there and use them to elevate yourself above others or to, you know, push others away or anything like that, but to genuinely engage others as human beings. And interestingly, we could say, coming back to this topic, that is what the acting consciousness, the confessing consciousness did in fact do with its confession, right? It took on the judgment made by the judging consciousness and said, as Hegel's going to tell you here, I am so that that's me. I'm going to be honest with you. You know, we, we have all these catchphrases in our contemporary culture, like, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, I'm going to be like really frank and open with you, all these sorts of things. Sometimes when people say that, they're actually BSing, they're putting on airs, they're putting on a front. But sometimes they're actually opening up and they're saying, yeah, uh, that is the way I am. And notice that this doesn't just happen by the acting person by themselves over on their side in their little bubble, you know, doing some self scrutiny. It requires an other, you know, the, again, a bit of a side note, but self consciousness, Hegel insists over and over and over again from the very beginning of the self consciousness section exists in relation to an other. You can't have a self consciousness entirely by itself. And that is what the judging consciousness is going to attempt to do by hardening its heart. And Hegel here does, in fact, use the term, you know, heart to, heart to herz, right? The hard heart. This is going to be quite important. Um, well, let's, let's jump into the text. There's a lot more to say along the way. Again, this is a very rich section. There's a lot to explore here, but, you know, we can, we can uh, go into those. So he says, the confession of the one who is wicked, the evil or wicked consciousness, the individual, the one who acts and does so on the basis of motives and intentions that the judging consciousness says are not only particular, but selfish, right? The, there's a disjunction between the action itself considered in itself, which would be doing duty for duty's sake, which Hegel in a couple of paragraphs earlier said, well, that doesn't really happen. Um, but maybe it does happen, right? There's a disjunction there that's being identified in the acting and confessing consciousness has now said, yeah, that's, that's, that's real. That is part of what's going on with me. So they made a confession and it's, the confession is, I am so, it's not followed by a reciprocal similar confession. So there's a judgment that's made, right? The acting and evil consciousness, instead of persisting, instead of hardening itself, you know, in, in remaining in its own point of view, Baharin, uh, doesn't harden itself. It doesn't create a shell. It actually takes to heart the language of judgment. It confesses, I am so. That's not necessarily saying that's all there is to me, but it is at least saying, yeah, you're right about this, you know, which opens up the possibility for a reciprocity. Now, the other side, the judging consciousness, has the possibility of saying all sorts of things in response. And there is an expectation here on the part of the acting and confessing consciousness that the other person is gonna behave in a similar fashion, that they're gonna say, well, you know, I myself, let, let's say we're taking an example of like anger, right? I act in anger, I do something that is uh, mean-spirited, but also accomplishes something good. You know, I see some people being bullied and, and treated badly. And I, I, you know, go and act as a vigilante and beat the crap out of the people who are bullying. Okay, now the judging consciousness looks at me and says, 
You think what you're doing is, is good, but really it's motivated by the fact that you have a problem with anger and you got a little bit of something out of beating these, these people up. Like you got to think of yourself as an action star, like all those movies and video games that you play, or you got to discharge some of the, uh, you know, whatever bully weight of bullying that, that happened to you back when you were uh, a child or make up whatever thing you want in, involved in the judgment. Right, so the evil consciousness then says, yeah, you're right. Okay, so now what I did was, was good in a certain sense because it prevented this other person from getting hurt. And in a certain sense, there's a little cosmic justice in these jerks over here getting their, their you know, teeth kicked in. But I really wasn't doing it for the right reasons. And maybe I'm just perpetuating the cycle of violence and you know, add whatever other tropes you want in there. And now the... the confessing consciousness expects something from the other side of the judging consciousness. Like, oh, it's okay, man. I've been there myself. You know, I really struggled a lot with my own misplaced anger. Let's read, <laughs> let's read Seneca's on anger together and we'll talk about it, right? That, that would be some sort of reciprocity or it could be, oh, you know, I, I can't relate to that. But, you know, I do have problems with other things. My anger isn't getting in people's faces and popping them in the mouth and saying, knock it off, jackass. Instead, it's being passive aggressive and like, you know, recording people on a camera and then posting it on Instagram or Twitter and saying, look at this jerk, you know, and hoping it gets picked up and shared by others. Or it could be, well, you know, I don't really actually have any, any problem with anger, but here's something about myself. It could even be, you know, I was actually a little bit off base in how I judged you. I, I went a little bit too far. I didn't think about what it's like to be in your situation and to have to act. And we could multiply examples of this confession, judgment, expectation, and then something not happening over and over and over again. It doesn't have to be anger. It could be embezzling. It could be cheating on tests. It could be slacking off with work. It could be anything that we want. So long as there's something where a person is doing things and the action is being viewed from multiple perspectives. So he says, um, they're looking for a reciprocal similar confession. This was not what the judging consciousness meant. Quite the contrary. So the judging consciousness was not in, in engaging in judgment, in communicating that judgment to the acting uh, consciousness who then confesses, was not opening up this up to like, let's have a discussion, or I'm going to relate to you as you're relating to me. They are withdrawn into themselves. There is a, we could call it line of refusal here. And there's going to be a certain contradiction, a Widerspruch, as Hegel's going to talk about it later on, that is going on within this. And here we should think of the contradiction, not in terms of, aha, gotcha, you're a hypocrite, right? We've already gone through hypocrisy plenty in the previous paragraphs. Notice that Hegel's not talking about that here. Instead, there's, a, there's too much going on here for the story or the non-story that the judging consciousness is telling. And the judging consciousness is telling this story to itself, especially to itself, also to the acting and evil consciousness, and to whatever spirit happens to be in this place. So... He goes on, the, the judging consciousness repels this community of nature and is the hard heart that is for itself and which rejects any continuity, any commonality, any equivalence with the other. So as a result, he says, the situation is reversed. A reversal is taking place here. The one who made the confession sees himself repulsed. And now this is quite interesting. The one who made the confession acknowledged themselves as being bad, boozing, evil, wicked, however you want to translate it. Now we've already seen that 
the judging consciousness in the previous paragraphs is revealed as being base, niedertrachtige, right? Pulling things down, schlecht, common, bad in a certain way, but not evil, böse. But now it actually is being evil, isn't it? It is being wicked. How so? By its very rejection. He says, um, the one who made the confession sees himself repulsed and sees the other to be in the wrong. Why? When he refuses to let his own inner being come out, come forth into the outer existence of speech. What's going on there? Hegel's saying that there may be some communication taking place, but what's happening on the part of the judging consciousness who has already engaged in communicative whatever we want to call it. It's not quite action, but it is communication in the judgment is now refusing further communication is now making the conversation. If there is a conversation going on to, to remain within the framework of judgmentality, we could say, and confession, you know, and, and if there is a response, it's yeah, you are that bastard who is like that. And that's, what's wrong with you, jackass, right? Instead of there being a, oh, yeah, I'm sorry that, you know, things are so rough for you or I can relate to you or anything like that happening. So that's a bad action. That's a bad comportment on the part of the judging consciousness or at least a bad expression, a bad communication that's a non-communication. And so he, he goes on and he says, um, here we go. He refuses to let his own inner being come forth into the outer existence of speech. When the other contrasts the beauty of his own soul, the beautiful soul, right? With the penitent's wickedness, yet confronts the confession of the penitent with his own stiff necked, unrepentant character, mutely keeping to himself and refusing to throw himself away for somebody else. So this is interesting. There's a communication here that is a refusal of communication that communicates all the more by what is not being done, by what is not being said to the other. This happens all the time, doesn't it? It doesn't have to happen. These dynamics of, of confession and openness and refusal don't just happen at this point in the phenomenology, they happen in all sorts of people's lives, don't they? And in terms of how not just individuals relate to each other, but how groups relate to each other. You know, historic injustices has been done. Oh, we're, you know, we're gonna make the, the people who suffered the historical injustices who then have to act to like stay alive or preserve their own, their own uh, stories. We're gonna make them into the bad guys and we'll just hold back here in a bastion of privilege and say, those people, you know, they're no good. Well, this happens all the time. So he goes on and he says, um, mutely keeping to himself. And what we've got here is the penitent has, has, you know, being confronted with wickedness, which they've already confessed. We see some other things going on that we're going to get to in just a bit. And so refusing to throw himself away for someone else. Now, does he have to throw himself entirely away? No. Just open the, the hard heart a bit. And so he says, there is here expressed in its extreme form, the rebellion of the spirit that is certain of itself. So it looks like spirit is on the side of the judging consciousness, right? That's the shape of consciousness that matters the most. Um, it's a rebellion and purung of spirit certain of itself, certain of itself, you know, gewiss, right? Uh, gewissin is conscience. This, this whole thing has been about conscience, hasn't it? So this, this is the, the, the conscience that is tied up inside of itself and is asserting itself over the other consciousness and refusing to give even an inch or an opening. And he says, it's, uh, it beholds itself as this simple self-knowledge in someone else. Now notice, it doesn't, here's where it gets a little contradictory, right? It, it understands itself as simple self-knowledge, 
But in itself? No, in, in another, in its relationship to another, in its ability to judge the other and thereby make itself good as opposed to the bad. And this is quite interesting because another way of translating empurung here is not just rebellious, rebellion or rebelliousness, but resentment. Right? There's something here that actually, in some respects, echoes, or it doesn't echo because it's before, it sort of prefigures what Nietzsche is going to call resentiment, using the French term for that, and diagnose in works like Beyond Good and Evil and Genealogy of Morals and other places, making the other bad so you can be good. Right? So he goes on and he says, um, here we go. It beholds itself as this simple self-knowledge in someone else. And two, in such a way that the outer shape of this other is not, as in the case of material wealth, something without substantial being. It's not a thing. It's not objectifying the other person and making them into a mere thing. It's actually, you know, treating them as the, the bastard, the jerk that they are. Only a, only a person or something with agency can be a jerk, a bastard, an evil thing. A thing by itself can't be, right? So wealth can't be. He says, on the contrary, what is held opposed to this other is thought. Thought on the part of this, this judging consciousness. Simply knowledge itself, this absolutely fluid continuity of pure knowing. Now here's a key point, which refuses to put itself into communication with the other which in its confession had ipso facto, by that very confession, renounced its separate being for self, right? And by the way, there's, there's a terminological thing here that's going to get lost a little bit. Separate and then particularity. Okay, these are both coming from Besonde, right? Um, something that's individuated, something that has been made on its own distinguished from other things, right? So the acting and confessing consciousness has renounced, not, it hasn't renounced being for self per se. It still has being for self, right? It still is self-reflective. Otherwise it couldn't take a position of, oh man, I actually am a bad guy, right? Or, or bad whatever. Um, but it's renounced separate being for self. It's no longer persisting in that. It's, it's not saying, you know, I'm a bad guy and screw all of you. I'm going to keep on being a bad guy. It's confessed it. It wants to, to make it right. It wants to restore connection to others, right? And by doing so, it supersedes particularity. Now, supersedes there is um, aufgehoben, right? And so we have uh, a dialectical advance going on here. There's, there's the dialectical advance really happening on the side of the evil consciousness. This is the consciousness, the judging consciousness over here that's digging in, hardening itself, it seems to think that it's the one who's got it all figured out, but really it's the action of confession that is doing something, doing something new here that's connecting it with, with spirit in, in a broader sense. So, like it says, it, it expressly superseded its particularity. In doing so, it posited itself in continuity with the other as a universal. Now, did it make itself into the universal? <clears throat> no. It's saying there's something bigger than the both of us. Let's both confess. Let's both be honest with each other. Let's both have this reciprocity. Let's both have this opening of being towards the other and get to know for maybe the first time who we really are not just as separate things, but in relation to each other, in a relationship within spirit. Uh, it, that's what Hegel's calling spirit here. And it could be like within the framework of the individual relationship. Let's also understand ourselves in relation to the larger world that we're, we're part of, right? Our families, our friends, our communities, our history. So, you know, of course, I'm reading a lot in here, <laughs> I, I know, but that's, I think that's something that you can read in here. So he says, um, 
Here we go. The other retains within itself and for itself. It actually says, you know, retains in itself, on im zelp zik, within, within itself, right? Um, what does it retain? Its own, uh, here we go. The other retains within itself and for itself. It's uncommunicative being for self. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Its own uncommunicative being for self, sein zig nick, Mitteilendes für sich sein, right? So für sich sein, being for self. This has being for self in a different way than this one does, right? It's, it's sort of like, this is my being for self. You don't get to talk about it. You don't get to look at it. I get to think about it. Whereas this one is more open, right? You can think about my being for self. You can tell me if I've got it wrong. Mitteilendes, nicht mitteilendes, not communicating, but also not taking part, not sharing, right? Not, not giving a part of itself to the other, not giving any openings. It, it has hardened itself here. So it says it retains in the face of the individual who did confess just the same uncommunicative being for self. It, it displays this being for self that it has for itself in the face of the other, which then can't really do anything with it other than be like, well, this is an opportunity we're losing out on. And I don't know why you want to be a prick about this, but you certainly are. Uh, I wish you would, you know, open up and confess in turn to me, but you're not. And he goes on and he says, though the latter already threw this away, it thereby reveals itself. Now, so this was a, a, Rebellion of spirit, certain of itself, right? But this is actually losing spirit. It says it reveals itself as a consciousness which is forsaken by and which itself denies spirit. So Geist verlassene, it's been forsaken by, the spirit has left it behind. Uh, it denies, verleugnende spirit. It, it is in the process of denying spirit. So even while it's claiming to be the, the dominant, the, the right, the, the proper thinking consciousness, spirit is leaving it behind. And so it says, it does not know that spirit in the absolute certainty of itself, which, which it thinks it has, but it doesn't really have, is Lord and Master. Now, Lord and Master is just Meister. There, there aren't two terms there. That's just, you know, Miller adding in an extra term. So meister of what? Of every deed and actuality, every tat, every wirklichkeit, and can cast them off and make them as if they never happened. Now that's not going to happen here so much, but it's going to happen in the paragraphs to come. At the same time, it, what is that? It, the judging consciousness, does not recognize the contradiction, the Widerspruch it falls into in not letting the rejection which has taken place. Now, the rejection that has taken place, this is interesting, right? It's been uncommunicative, but has it really been uncommunicative? No, it's taken place in words. <laughs> It has taken place through communication. There's definitely a contradiction there. You know, it's sort of like when, when somebody is on bad terms with you and you're, and you're like, I'm not speaking with you. And they're like, you're speaking to me right now. There's a contradiction, right? That's the same kind of contradiction as is going on here. I am hardening my heart against you. I will not listen to a thing that you say. And then they say something and you're like, I will not listen to that thing that you said just there. Like, well, you're listening, aren't you? <laughs> There's, there's a contradiction. And the hardness of the heart is, is really quite silly in, in, in many respects, isn't it? So he, he goes on and he says, um, does not recognize the contradiction it falls into and not letting the rejection, which has taken place in words, be validated as a genuine rejection while itself 
has the certainty of its spirit not in an actual deed, but in its inner being and finds the outer existence of this inner being in the utterance of its judgment. So it reiterates its judgment. The, the acting consciousness has already heard the judgment. This is not new to it, right? In some respects, the, the judging consciousness, while it could have so much to say, just keep saying the same damn things over and over and over again, and by doing so, it's missing the opportunity and mistaking the possibility of what, what's there. So he goes on and he says, it's thus its own self, which hinders that others return from the deed into the spiritual existence of speech and into the identity of spirit. And by this hardness of heart produces the disparity which still exists. So... Spirit is something that's bigger than, than either side here. And the acting consciousness has at least gotten itself to the point where now it can actually be ready in spirit to have this mutual recognition of the other self-consciousness that has engaged in judging it. It's, it's, it's not even like judging in return the other self-consciousness other than to say, man, you're kind of a jerk. You won't, you won't actually like even accept my apology or my confession, you know, in any sort of spirit of, of togetherness or, or honesty or openness. You're, you're just like staying within yourself and being better than everybody else. But you're not being better than everybody else. You're, you're, you're failing in that respect. And you're being left behind by spirit in the process.